where to look. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for your patience as we got things organized here in the in-person space. Um, I know we have folks joining our live stream as well. So thank you for your patience out there in the internet world. Um, we're really excited to be here for our final session of SBX 2022. Uh, it's been a great pleasure joining with all of you these last three days. My name is Carrie Mead. I'm the executive director of the Smart Building Center. And right now I'm located inside the space where our actual offices are located in Beacon Hill in Seattle, Washington. Um, and we're here with some folks in the audience and we have folks joining us online. Today, our final session is going to be building performance reporting, how smart technology can help. Uh, the Smart Building Center is a nonprofit organization located in the Beacon Hill neighborhood of Seattle. We launched in 2017 through the collective efforts of several Seattle area business leaders. And over the last five years, we've grown from our roots in the local community to hosting regular events online and in person uh, that attract an audience from across the globe. Our growth comes from our partner businesses and their tireless efforts to accelerate adoption of smart buildings, practices, and technologies our small but passionate and dedicated staff, and from the growing need and desire for smarter buildings that fuel productive workplaces, cut carbon emissions, enable grid interactive eco districts, and promote our overall health and well being. I've said this already, but I'll say it again our discussion today is taking place in person and it's being live streamed across the globe to our conference attendance, attendees. What a time we live in! <laughs> All of this is thanks to our incredible conference sponsors, Long Building Technologies, McKinstry, MacDonald Miller, Puget Sound Energy, Seattle City Light, ATS Automation, DB Engineering, BOMA Seattle King County, Washington State Department of Commerce, Sky Foundry, and Alps Controls. And since we're live, let's a round of applause for our sponsors. Uh, without further ado, it is my great pleasure to start today's final session of SBX 2022. I'm going to give our panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves, then we'll have a series of presentations from some who have slides to share, and then we'll enter into a moderated discussion. So I'm just going to turn to the right here and start with you, Sandra. Sure. Hello. My name is Sandra Mallory. I am the Buildings and Energy Program Manager for the City of Seattle's Office of Sustainability and Environment. Um, and my role is essentially to bring all of the buildings in Seattle to net zero carbon. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Luke Howard. I'm a Building Performance Specialist with Washington State Department of Commerce. Uh, my primary role with Commerce is the technical lead for the Clean Buildings Performance Standard. Hi, my name is Akshay Johar. I am a principal program manager from Microsoft. And uh, my role in Microsoft is uh, to lead the smart buildings and smart places and energy effort to see how technologies like digital twins can enable sustainability reporting and optimization for buildings inside. Okay, and so in addition to having convened live and live streamed, we also have some folks joining us remotely. Um, and so I'm not sure exactly which order we're in from where I'm standing. Um, so if Brett, if you could, if we could start with you. Yeah, um, Brett Bridgeland, manager with RMI's Carbon Free Buildings Practice, um, joining you today from Boulder, Colorado, and I'm, I'm excited to be here. Uh, my background is in architecture and engineering, and in my work, I um, uh, engage with, with large portfolios and agencies to figure out how to accelerate decarbonization of buildings, and that ranges from um, from New York to to Mumbai and sort of everything in between. And so we'll talk about some examples today. Thank you. And then Thanks. Ross, our final panelist. Hi, yeah. So um, could you hear echo? I guess not. No, I um, so I'll go anyway. Uh, Ross McQuinney, I'm a senior advisor at the Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice. Um, I work on developing policy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in buildings uh, and was part of the team that developed on building performance standard. Uh, and now I'm deeply involved in its implementation. Uh, I also do the greenhouse gas accounting. 
So good to, good to be here. Welcome. Okay, Ross, I will say we don't hear an echo, but there is a little bit of, I don't know, exact distortion happening with your audio. So we'll, we'll see if we can resolve that over the next few minutes. So thank you all. Um, we're going to kick off with uh, Luke Howard, who's subbing in for Emily, uh, who was supposed to be here, but had some events at home. So she will be joining us online for questions after. And Luke, if you want to come on up and start your presentation. I, do you mind grabbing this? Great, thank you. All right, good morning. Uh, thanks for having us today. Um, like Carrie said, I'm pinch hitting for Emily today. Some of you may have been expecting Emily. She is our, our team lead for the Clean Building Performance Standard, and she's really the, the policy wonk and the, and the brains behind the, all that. Um, so I was asked to provide a brief introduction and an overview of the implementation of the Washington State's Clean Building Performance Standard, including the early adopter incentive. So that's what we'll be doing here. Um, it's about two hours worth of content and hopefully less than 10 minutes. So hopefully I can go through it fairly clearly um, using other people's notes. So <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Um, note that on our last slide, we have contact information. So we do operate a hotline. So emails, phone calls uh, is a great way to get your questions answered. Uh, we may not have time to get to them all today. So I'm gonna, okay. So this slide just represents our agency's purpose, which is to strengthen communities, commerce, touches every aspect of community and economic development. Okay, so just to give a little context, uh, buildings um, contribute to over a quarter of all the greenhouse gas emissions in the state. It's the fastest growing source of emissions. And nationally, 40% uh, of all our energy used comes from buildings. So in order to meet our greenhouse gas emission limits in statute, we have to take action in, building, in the building section and specifically with existing buildings, right? We've got a pretty robust uh, energy code. So new buildings are getting taken care of um, as they're built these days. So to be uh, pretty low emissions. But these existing buildings are problematic because it's hard to get into them and, and um, gain efficiency from them after they're recently built. So as a result, the Clean Buildings Law was authorized by House Bill 1257 in 2019 by the Washington State Legislature. So there's two phases of implementation. There's the incentive program and then mandatory compliance. So I'm gonna be talking first about tier one buildings, which was based on the 2000 19 legislation. On my last slide or close to the end, I'll talk a little bit about the new legislation for tier two buildings. But the majority of this program is gonna be talking about tier one buildings that was uh, born from this 2019 legislation. So the two phases of, of implementation, again, it's the incentive program and then mandatory compliance. It applies to buildings, all commercial buildings over 50,000 square feet. Uh, that includes hotel, motel, and uh, dormitories, but not multifamily or uh, other residential applications. So the law is based on ASHRAE standard 100. So that's the reference standard for the law. Uh, Commerce has developed amendments to the standard to conform with the legislation. These amendments can be found under WAC 194-50. There is also an integrated document that ASHRAE developed for us that integrates all uh, the state's amendments for the Clean Building Performance Standard into the ASHRAE 100 document. You can find that uh, on our website. Always nice to go to one source instead of going back and forth from uh, base documents to state amendments. 
So all buildings benchmark their buildings and then produce an operation and maintenance program and an energy management plan. So required for all for compliance for all buildings, um, unless they meet one of the exemptions. Buildings over the target by building type must also complete a building improvement plan to bring their buildings within the compliance of uh, the compliance of the target. So energy use intensity target is the performance metric um, for the standard. There is an alternative performance metric. If you can't meet the EUIT, maybe because you uh, can't meter the building, uh, it's on the master meter with, uh, with lots of other buildings. Um, you can't really create an EUI in those kind of instances. And you can either install submeters or you can pursue the alternative path, which is called the investment criteria. Investment criteria is essentially uh, performing an ASHRAE level two audit, and then all the identified energy efficiency measures from that audit are then passed through a an, uh, life cycle cost analysis in accordance with Annex X of the standard. So Annex X is not part of ASHRAE 100, it's an amendment, it's a chapter we developed specifically to outline the uh, life cycle cost analysis and the investment criteria for the standard. So any, um, as part of this alternative approach to the energy use intensity target, the investment criteria requires you to run that uh, all energy efficiency measures through that life cycle cost analysis, and then all energy efficiency measures deemed to be cost effective in accordance with that criteria need to be implemented and installed and then measurement and verification performed, okay? So there are, like as I mentioned, there are specific exemptions uh, for agricultural buildings, for example, uh, industrial buildings. Uh, there's a plethora of different exemptions um, and exemptions are a compliance path. So just because you are exempt, you still have to apply for exemption uh, building uses and activities change over time. So every five year, it's a five year cycle. So every five years, um, you have to reapply for compliance, whether it's through exemption or through one of the performance metrics. Uh, if, if you don't comply, uh, buildings out of compliance can face penalties. And that penalty is $1.50 a square foot, the max penalty is, plus $5,000. So uh, mandatory compliance will follow, an early adopt, uh, will follow the Early Adopter Incentive Program. I'll talk a little more about the Early Adopter Incentive Program later. The initial compliance with the Clean Building Performance Standard is staggered over a three-year period. So starting with the largest buildings beginning in June of 2026. So future compliance is based on a, a five-year cycle from these initial compliance dates, and owners of commercial buildings are responsible for compliance with the standard by the scheduled compliance dates to avoid penalty. This process is it's a process-oriented standard with long lead times, right? So 2026 is a few years away still. Uh, that's to help keep compliance costs down. So it's most cost-effective to start the compliance process early. Um, so start now by benchmarking your building. Uh, if you can't benchmark your buildings, can't create an EUI, uh, can't create a target EUI, then you will know right away whether you need to go down the uh, performance, the investment criteria performance metric. Sorry about that, I'm, I've got notes up here and I'm not following along too well, but that was the previous slide. So it just outlines the date. 26 is the biggest buildings, 27 is the middle-sized buildings, and 28 is the smaller buildings, 50,000 to 90,000 square feet. That's the compliance dates. All right, so we do have a clean buildings portal. So this is a database that, um, Commerce is developing. This is where you can view and verify your parcel or building information if you're a building owner. 
the manage the roles and authorize users to work on the parcel or building profile for compliance, submit applications for the early adopter incentive program, submit um, compliance forms when it comes to the compliance period, track compliance requirements, check on the status of applications, and make changes to your account information. So that's the specific clean buildings portal. We also have a clean buildings website that has a plethora of information as well. So the early adopter incentive is an incentive for uh, early adopters. Folks that are required to uh, comply with the law can um, apply for this incentive uh, through that portal I was talking about. Uh, there are eligibility requirements. Again, the building's got to be over 50,000 square feet, so covered building by the law. It will also include some buildings that are not uh, covered by the law, which is multifamily buildings over 50,000 square feet and uh, buildings owned by federally recognized tribes. So they're not subject to compliance with the law itself, but they can, we encourage them to uh, pursue early compliance and receive the incentive, which is 85 cents a square foot, which can help get you towards that, that goal. Now, one of the big eligibility requirements is your initial EUI needs to be 15 KBTUs per square foot per year higher than the target. So we want to target those buildings that have a, li a little bit of work to do, right? Um, more can be found uh, through the guidebook um, on our webpage. I'm not going to go into too much detail, more detail about that. I talked a little bit already that said that we did have a webpage. It's got a plethora of information. Um, Anna Lynn Bergen is our, um, our website guru. She does a great job keeping um, the website even evolving, uh, organized, where you can find the materials fairly easily. It is quite, like I said, it's quite uh, a large website. If you have specific questions for certain resources and can't navigate to it, feel free to give us a call, check in with us, we can point it to you. Okay, so tier two buildings. Um, Senate Bill 5722 uh, went through session in two, uh, earlier this year, and out of that came uh, the development of an expansion of the Clean Building Performance Standard. So this will apply to buildings between 20 and 50,000 square feet, including multifamily. So this increases uh, the influence of the standard uh, to a great scale. Uh, not a performance standard until 2031. So what it's gonna require is benchmarking of these buildings and the implementation of an operations and maintenance program and an energy management plan in accordance with the standard. So that O&M and EMP plan are well-defined within the standard. Um, so each of these buildings are gonna have to create a minimum the benchmarking O&M and EMP. And then in 2031, uh, there will likely be a performance standard uh, similar to what we have for the tier one buildings. So uh, on behalf of the Clean Buildings team, we wanna thank you for this opportunity to share with you today. Please visit our webpage, inscribe to our bulletin, we put out bulletins on occasion when we come out with specific guidance that may be um, additional to what's available through other resources. For questions or additional assistance, uh, please email us at buildings at commerce.wa.gov. Oops, sorry, I'm not keeping up real good here. So you can see our website at the bottom there. I imagine you guys will get a copy of these presentations so that web site will be available for you there. That's all I got for you today. Thank you for your time.
Thanks so much, Luke. Um, next, I'm going to call up Sandra Mallory from the city of Seattle. All right. Okay, hello. So uh, again, Sandra Mallory from the Office of Sustainability. And I'm just gonna start by saying, well, this is a, I think, focused a lot on technology. What Luke and I are both talking about is regulation, which is the, maybe engenders the development of technology to help meet regulations. And I'll also say that I'm trained as an architect, worked as an architect for a long time, never really thought I would be the policy wonk creating regulation. But in fact, we have a pretty daunting task ahead of us to meet these uh, carbon reduction goals that Luke referenced. And so voluntary action has not been getting that, us there. And so this is where we're going. So as the policy wonk lead on my team, um, not the brains, the brains are on the rest of the team. Um, it is we do, you know, the intent is to create regulations that are effective, but also equitable and you know, really working on how we can make the best use of these regulations to help buildings prepare for the future. So um, we, let's see here, I got to do two advancements at a time. This is so hard. Um, so really applaud the state for their work to develop and implement the clean building standard. And it's really important and foundational for improving the energy efficiency and reducing emissions across the state and engaging with building owners on improving their buildings. And in the city of Seattle, with our carbon neutral electric supply, um, we need to really hone in on how we transition mechanical systems, buildings to cleaner energy sources and to systems that are less emitting. And so we in the city of Seattle are proposing additional requirements for buildings, um, kind of overlays a carbon intensity standard on what the state is already doing. And that clearly indicates to the market that we are headed to net zero carbon buildings um, by 2045. Um, and so as building owners are ramping up to make investments for the clean building standard for the state's energy targets, we wanna be sure that owners are considering the long-term need to decarbonize buildings. Um, so we've been working with stakeholders throughout 2022 to develop our proposed uh, building performance standards, emissions performance standards, and the mayor is expected to introduce legislation in December. So, the basics of what we are proposing, um, very similar to the state, um, in that we are, first of all, it will apply to buildings over 20,000 square feet, both commercial and multifamily, both what the state is calling tier one and tier two buildings. Um, it will be in five year compliance cycles that align with the state's timing and also align with the, the size segments of the state. Um, we will be required, we, we will be, we are proposing legislation, I'm getting ahead of myself in the city council. Um, we are proposing legislation that would have benchmarking verification. So making sure that as we are regulating how your building is performing, the information we have about that is accurate. Um, that there would be some planning required by building owners, really simple documentation to say, I know what's coming. I know what's in my building and the next target in the next cycle is X. And so I, yes, I am aware. Um, and then emissions targets. And these again, phased in by building size, phased in um, in these five-year compliance cycles. We are working with SPW consultants on what these targets will be. We will actually be um, establishing these targets in rulemaking in 2023, but are putting the the guardrails around that in the legislation and are working with them to come up with the preliminary targets. And the way we're doing that is essentially we at the city of Seattle, we already have, we've had a benchmarking energy and benchmarking reporting program since 2011. We are taking the 2019 data. We are skipping 2020, 21, cause not good data. And this is the baseline for the different building types, same building types that the state is using, then projecting down to 2045 and setting these emissions targets for those different building types at five-year increments. All right, let's go on. 
Um, and so that's the process for how we're establishing the targets. So as I mentioned, the same as with the state, we're on these five year cycles and you know, each year of compliance, a different building size. So starting in 2026. One of the things, you know, Luke mentioned that we have owners still have time to plan. Well, we're getting legislation to council at the end of this year, rulemaking next year. 2026 is the first compliance deadline. In a building's life, that is a very short time frame, and we recognize that. So for the first compliance cycle, which will be in 2026 to 2030, um, it would apply just to commercial buildings, not multifamily buildings. And we are asking owners to reduce a certain percentage. So you don't necessarily need to meet the target. If you meet the target, great, you've complied. But, and, you know, the, the reduction expectation would be, you know, around 10 to 15%. And we are working with our consultants on what that would be. All right. So the next compliance cycle um, would be to meet the emissions targets. And this is where some of that planning documentation comes in. I know that in 2036, I'm going to have to meet X target for my building if I'm over 220,000 square feet. So meeting that next emissions target. Um, and then at the end, the final compliance cycle would be to achieve net zero emissions. So what we're trying to do, and it's a little different than how the state has been able to do this with the energy is we're saying, let's, let's show the trajectory for the different buildings. So owners know what's coming. And so if you wanna get to net zero emissions off the bat, fabulous, you're ahead of the game. It's gonna make your life a lot easier in the next 20 years. Um, so then, we also recognize that not all buildings are the same. Um, there we go. So for multifamily buildings and somewhat like the, tier, like the tier two requirements for the state, the first emissions targets are not going to be until this compliance cycle in 2031. So multifamily buildings have a a buy, if you will, in this first compliance cycle, and that would need to start meeting emissions targets in 2031. We hope to work with owners to encourage um, the work. They will still need to do their benchmarking verification and the planning documentation. Again, this is what's coming. Make sure you, you start heading there. And then for affordable housing, we recognize that um, there are just the capital needs planning and funding cycles and complexities of funding affordable housing and complexities of maintaining affordable housing in an expensive city are such that we are not, the first compliance cycle for them would not be until 2036 to 2040. So we're giving them even greater leeway. And then there are also, you know, other, um, ways for alternative compliance. I think, in the, in the regulatory world, here is what we want owners to do. And we can expect maybe 80% of them for that to work. And there's another 20% that are just different issues. It's, you know, the target is set on an average and you're like way at the end as an outlier or, you know, just particular conditions. So I'm gonna walk through sort of the, the exemption extensions, you know, the, the different ways that owners might comply. And one of them is instead of your target being based on the average for that building type, be based on your building itself. And there would have to be some planning associated with this. You know, what is your baseline? Go to zero. And then where do your targets along that pathway? Um, the second option is portfolio or campus. Let's say you own a large group of buildings or you're on a campus that isn't separately metered. And for those buildings, and these would be for public entities and nonprofits. So we wanna make sure for the portfolios, we wanna make sure these are long-term owners. We can't have portfolios with buildings popping in and out every three years. Um, I know that's not how real estate thinks about it, popping in and out, but that's, you know, <laughs> compliance that we think about it. And then, you know, for campuses, you might be on a district system, so you don't have to separately meter each building. And the 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 targets would be pro, you know, would be prorated based on the different use types within those buildings. Next, we would also we're proposing <laughs> this is um, that there would be uh, an alternative prescriptive options for very simple 
buildings. So multifamily buildings in the city of Seattle, many of them, mm -hmm. the only emissions producing equipment is a gas fired boiler for their domestic hot water. So maybe you don't have to do the calculations, you just change that out. You just change the gas boiler to a heat pump. It's so simple. Um, and that would be, you know, compliant. Or we're also looking at exemption for all electric systems. Again, we are in the um, city of Seattle's city light territory where electricity is carbon neutral. And so we don't want to, you know, have people calculating their targets if they're already all electric and essentially carbon neutral. Um, and then lastly, we're looking at an option, which would be an alternative compliance payment. So recognizing that, you know, we have this trajectory and, you know, we want, you know, people to take, go down in steps to net zero carbon. But, you know, upgrades in buildings happen once in a, in a long while. And it might be that you want to defer or some say kick the can down the row, I'm gonna say defer your upgrade until the next cycle. And then you would pay into an alternative compliance or a, a climate investment fund. And we would use those funds to get emissions savings elsewhere. And so the idea is it's, it's someone has asked us if we couldn't just do a cap and trade kind of system. It's a little like that. I, we have to think about that. That would be very complicated, but you know, and the cost is based on the social cost of carbon that the um, UTC uses. So we would base it on the social cost of carbon for the total emissions above your target that you are emitting for each of those five years in the cycle. And lastly, I am going to say we are from the government and we're here to help. Um, so we are regulating and working very hard to provide the support systems that owners need to be able to do the work in these buildings. So we have launched a clean buildings accelerator and I want to give a shout out to PSE who has done this before us and we're sort of modeling some of our work on what they've done. So we have a consultant, in fact, the same consultant is working with PSE as with us um, to help building owners to do sort of a help desk, provide some handholding, coaching and then we're working hard to find resources to actually provide money for engineering analysis and capital assistance especially for under resourced buildings like affordable um, housing nonprofits buildings that serve bipoc communities so i am going to stop there i think i've probably talked plenty and move along to our next presenter thank you Okay, so now we are going to move to some of our panelists who are joining us remotely and we're going to start with you, Ross. Okay, does my audio sound better? It does sound better. Good, okay. So, all right, so yeah, thanks again for having me. Uh, again, I'm here from the Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about our building performance standard, uh, as well as our accelerator program. Um, just to frame this a little, uh, in New York City, uh, over two thirds of our citywide greenhouse gas emissions come from our building sector. Uh, that's in a city of about 1.1 million buildings. Uh, within that two thirds at 68%, uh, about a little more than half of that is concentrated in the 35,000 or so largest buildings in the city. So we've got a this very large concentrated source of emissions in our buildings, our, our, our large buildings, which we define as buildings larger than 25,000 square feet. And then the other half of that building-based emission segment is spread out over more than a million buildings. So we've got, uh, we know that our challenge is in our building sector, that's where we need to make progress, um, but it's kind of in those two forms of concentrated in large buildings and then spread out over many, many, many smaller properties. Um, we also know that 90% of the buildings that exist today will still be standing in 2050, so we can't uh, build new to solve this problem, uh, at least not solely. We need to do a lot of work in our existing buildings um, and we plan to do that through policies like our building performance standard by providing technical assistance. Uh, we believe this is going to drive economic development. 
um, and we are focused on an equitable transition away from fossil fuels. So in 2019, the city passed the Climate Mobilization Act, uh, which is you know, certainly the largest uh, climate policy in New York City's history. Um, and it involved several uh, kind of a suite of policies, uh, including our building performance standard. Uh, but I don't want to go through that until talking about kind of the background. Uh, this in 2019 was passed after over 10 years of uh, buildings, energy and efficient emissions policies uh, driven largely by our benchmarking and our energy audit laws, which were passed in 2009. Those supplied us with a lot of really, really useful data that allowed us to understand our building segment, our building stock uh, and how it consumes energy and how they uh, emit greenhouse gases uh, much more effectively. Um, we kind of studied that data throughout the 2010s, I would say, and uh, it was the foundation of uh, the development of the Climate Mobilization Act, which included uh, laws that require green roof and solar PV and new uh, construction um, that require large buildings to post energy efficiency grade labels uh, at the front of their buildings. It enabled the property assessed clean energy financing uh, tool or PACE. And then of course our building uh, performance standard local law 97, which I'll explain a little more. So local law 97 uh, focuses again on that large building segment of 35,000 or so uh, buildings, which are larger than 25,000 square feet. Uh, these buildings, uh, face emissions limits beginning in 2024. Uh, in that period, 2024 through 29, uh, about 75 to 80 percent of properties will will meet those limits kind of automatically. It, that period targets the the highest emitters in the building sector. Um, then in 2030, the limits will ratchet down and become a lot more ambitious. Uh, in that period, roughly 25 to 30 percent of properties will meet those limits outright. All other buildings will have to do some sort of work uh, to bring their buildings into compliance, although this will also coincide with uh, what we expect to be a deep decarbonization of our electric supply. Um, we have a separate pathway for buildings with uh, 35 percent or more of their residential units uh, under rent regulatory status. Uh, those buildings have to implement a prescriptive path of measures rather than meeting an emissions limit. And uh, we, we shaped the law that way to um, prevent the law from driving rents up really and, and pushing properties out of rent regulatory status in, in New York City. And I'm not sure rent regulation really exists in the same way in every other city, so it may not have a clear corollary in Seattle or in Washington, but uh, rent regulation is a, a big tool to provide or protect uh, affordable housing in New York City. So we had to kind of consider that in this law as well. A little more about the compliance methods. Um, you know, our basic metric is a greenhouse gas intensity metric. So knowing that that's uh, emissions per square foot. So knowing the gross floor area of the property and of the use spaces is critical. Um, buildings will need to comply starting, like I said, in uh, 2024, uh, sorry, actually they'll be reporting in 2025 on May 1st for the 2024 emissions year, this is a typo. Um, but all reports will need to be certified by a registered design professional. Um, and buildings uh, that go over their limits, we'll face a $268 per ton penalty. That uh, that value is, is determined based on uh, our best understanding of the costs of uh, implementing retrofits. So it's sized to drive compliance uh, and not just kind of have buildings assume this as the cost of doing business in New York. Um, so that's the, the basics of the law. Uh, we also have a, an accelerator program in place to help building owners uh, that are subject to local law, local law 97, as well as really all other buildings uh, 
larger than 5,000 square feet. This is a free one-on-one -on -one advisory service that provides technical guidance that helps building owners understand what their uh, compliance risk is, you know, what uh, policies they're subject to. Um, it helps them identify incentives and financing opportunities uh, within the utilities, uh, the state programs and others. Um, helps them assess, you know, the work ahead of them and the consultants that are out there um, and, you know, make uh, good choices in pursuing their retrofits. Uh, and really, I, I, I call it kind of an energy and emissions coaching. A um, little more on the accelerator, maybe I've covered this. It applies to buildings over 5,000 square feet. For smaller buildings, we have a separate program, which is, uh, we call it Electrify NYC. Um, and this is really, you can call directly, email, and get set up with an account manager, uh, which will kind of help you walk, walk through uh, your options. Um, that's everything I have for the presentation phase. Uh, if anybody's interested, they can reach the accelerator. At the Thank you, Ross. Um, okay, now we're going to go to our final set of slides. Um, Brett, are you ready to go? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to piggyback on what Ross was talking about and and talk a little bit about. Let me advance the slide here. Yep, there we go. Uh, talk a little bit about how this is playing out with some specific buildings in New York. And so um, I've over the last year, year and a half or so, had the opportunity to work with NYSERDA, which is um, New York's um, state energy office that's operating a program to help some of the most challenging building types figure out uh, how to decarbonize. And so, um, like Ross said, there's there are a number of things occurring that are sort of creating an ecosystem of, uh, of action. And so, um, at the state level, CLCPA is the is the um, state target of achieving a carbon free economy by the year 2050 with intermediate targets, and that includes uh, carbon free electricity on an, uh, by by 2040. Um, so there's that overview, uh, and then local law 97, as Ross was saying, is driving um, you know by 2024 a good chunk of buildings to take action by 2030. Uh, an even larger chunk of buildings to take action and ultimately targeting 80% uh, carbon reduction by 2050. So on top of that, we're also seeing um, New York's uh, gas ban taking effect on new construction. And so there's a, a number of things that are happening uh, to create this ecosystem of, of action. This NYSERDA program that I mentioned um, was, was crafted to engage a handful of some leading um, real estate partners in the in the New York market, uh, and their top-notch consultants, and an ICERTA team that includes us to figure out how to do this and some of the challenging building types and what we've learned over the last year. And this is going to be ongoing. Um, there's a second cohort kicking off right now. Is getting turned into this this heuristic or this this approach framework that we're calling resource efficient decarbonization to help us solve those buildings. I'll explain that. Uh, you know, in the Pacific Northwest, the electricity is already uh, very clean, but just to note that even in a cold climate like New York, uh, in today's grid, uh, heat pumps, which will have a COP coefficient of performance, typically 1.5 or, or better, are generally outpacing the alternatives in um, fossil fuel heat generation. And as electricity decarbonizes, like in the Northwest, it'll be the runaway runaway favorite. And so if we're gonna achieve 80% decarbonization in buildings, this does become a conversation about how to decarbonize heating. So um, the in, in tall or complex buildings, there are some interesting challenges and so so this graphic on the right here, um, the sort of business as usual approach, the audit driven interventions in buildings is likely not going to get us to where we need to do it in terms of it need to be in terms of building decarbonization because uh, those transit system transitions may need to occur over time. And I'll give some more examples. Um, 
in order to to bridge to the bridge the gap in terms of system compatibility and um, and in tall buildings in New York uh, heat pump capacities. And so it's an interesting question that's requiring this long term planning approach. Um, there is no business as usual anymore. Um, you know, in any system between now and 2050, there's going to be turnover. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's a mentality of looking long term and assessing where the risks are in the system typologies that are in a building. And so in a long view on carbon. So I mentioned with um, with tall or complex buildings, and really this applies to many building types, there's a certain amount of fossil fuel heat capacity that might be in a building today, whether it's a boiler or connection to a district steam or something. And there's a certain amount of heat pump capacity that uh, can fit in the building technically uh, or economically. And there may be a, a gap between those two. Um, and so to think about decarbonizing the heating in these buildings, there are probably going to have to be these enabling steps of uh, reducing energy loads and then some system some system uh, changes over time as well, reconfiguring distribution systems within buildings so that they're compatible with what uh, with the outputs of heat pumps. Uh, thermal energy recovery and thermal storage are also going to be important in many of these buildings. Um, and those can get us to the point where, again, now we can talk about um, replacing heating capacity with with right sized heat pumps. Um, you know, and also one of the other things that we've talked about with many partners is that there may be challenging conditions, outlying conditions that are difficult to solve right now or, or tough to justify economically, for instance. Um, but those can be solved separately over time as we learn um, how to operate these buildings, get comfortable with it, as, even as technology evolves and um, or additional investments are warranted in the building. And so uh, there's a lot we can do now that makes sense. The, like I said, these decarbonization over time approaches um, take foresight and planning ahead, which is a new mentality. It's different than the audit driven approach. Um, and the, we, we talk a lot about triggers when it comes to deep retrofits. So like, is there is there a moment where we're replacing a major piece of equipment where that's a, a, play, a moment to, to pause? Or is there building rep repositioning or affordable housing recapitalization and anchor, anchor tenant turnover, things like that. Um, and so the advanced planning as aspect is doing the enabling steps so that when you get to that trigger moment, you're ready for it. Um, and you can put in the system um, that makes the most sense and puts you on the long-term path to decarbonization. Um, and that doesn't happen automatically. That's a, that, that's, but, this ecosystem of local law 97 and CLCPA is creating the uh, impetus for real estate partners to take that long term view and do those strategic decarbonization assessments. Um, so I'm not going to go through it in all the detail, but you know, within those categories of reducing loads, reconfiguring systems, recovering heat, storing heat, there are all kinds of different um, tactics and even within heat pumps there's a whole taxonomy of heat pumps that we're actually talking about um, central and distributed and so there are a number of there's there's this whole uh, range of solutions that we could call a thermal network and um, while one for one sort of swap outs might get us there there's a huge opportunity um, to, to think about it more holistically and integrate these thermal networks within buildings to do all those things or even be between buildings or at a, at a city scale. Um, Seattle, I think, is actually at the forefront of um, tapping into muni municipal wastewater as a heat source, which is really exciting. New York's trying to figure out uh, how to do it on, on the heels of Seattle. So way to go, Seattle. Um, but there's, there's uh, going to be an opportunity to um, for experts to figure out how to uh, how to create those solutions. And so, um, and there's a need for ecosystems of support and service providers and products. We've got case studies from the first cohort that are up on the website, go check them out. Um, and there's also more stuff coming down the road. Uh, there's going to be a technology prize, $10 million technology prize 
announced this year that will preview like that. Thanks. Thanks so much, Brett. Um, so we're now going to switch to the moderated panel portion of the discussion, and I'm sort of on the fly figuring out how to coordinate questions after. But if there is time, we're going to reserve some time, hopefully, for um, audience questions. We, ha we know we already have some from folks who are tuning in um, via the internet, um, and we have folks in here as well. So um, for, my, for the panelists, um, because we have this kind of remote and in-person um, thing happening, I might flag someone that I think could start with the question response. Um, if you want to uh, chime in, just you know, say, I, I want to chime in. Raise your hand if you're here. I can see you on the screens over there as well, uh, Ross and Brett. Um, so with that, I'm going to dive in first. And Sandra, since you're right here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so today we heard about uh, examples of both mandated energy and carbon reporting. Do you think these two requirements are at odds with one another, or are they more complementary? Well, I am, of course, going to say that they are complementary. <laughs> um, we are not at odds with the state, and we would never wish to be. Um, I think, and we've had um, some interesting discussions in our technical advisory group and with stakeholders. Um, we've actually, re I'm going to say, you know, we've received a number of comments where people would like Seattle to go even further in terms of pushing energy efficiency and go further than the state is doing. We think that the state has a regulation in place and that that is we're going to let that play out. So um, I think that kind of what Brett was just talking about, the energy efficiency is first and foremost the way to reduce your load so that when you do go to changing out systems from, say, a gas boiler to a heat pump, you know, the sizing of that is more appropriate. And um, what we're finding in our municipal buildings is that by really focusing on efficiency and like doing, say, some ventilation effic energy efficiency, then we've reduced the load that's needed and therefore reduced the need to do a service upgrade for the electrical capacity. So I think they go absolutely hand in hand. There's no way um, we do not want a regulation in which people are simply switching one uh, fuel source for another. We want to make sure the buildings are better performing. And so that's where I think the two regulations tie together is the efficiency and, and the, also the emissions reduction on top of that. Great. Yeah, if I could add. Yeah, go ahead. Um, it seems, you know, electrifying efficiency is really important because it will save the building owners, uh, you know, money directly on their bill. But it, I think, as you were saying, would uh, postpone major uh, capital investments into the distribution system, uh, the electric distribution system. And in New York City, we've got very high electricity costs. Uh, and if we're anticipating that we'll be moving to a, so we are currently under a summer peaking electric system. So we're sized for all the cooling load that we have to deliver in the summer. But if we're anticipating electrifying our heating and hot water, um, that means that we may be moving to a winter peaking load, which might be larger. And if we can push that period out as far as possible through efficiency and uh, electrifying efficiently, we'll be saving ourselves a lot more money uh, in utility prices. So yeah, I think complimentary is definitely the right answer. So I agree. Yeah. Luke or Brett, Akshay, anything to add on this one? I don't have anything specific to add. I think two other panelists covered it well. Awesome. OK, so Akshay, they, oh, go ahead, Brett. Right, the, um, the performance reporting requirements are our tool, and, the, and they're complementary. Um, the performance standards then are sort of a trigger. And like I was saying, uh, th those are prompts for major real estate players to take a look at their portfolios and start planning ahead. And I think that's where it gets exciting because you're going to do that planning exercise and then they're going to recognize, oh, there's actually an opportunity to this. And so uh, I'm excited about the, the reporting and then you know, the uh, you know, performance standards down the road as, as prompts to do that planning that actually is advantageous. And could I just say I love this regulation as prompt instead of regulation. It's our new term. 
Um, okay, actually, I'm going to start with you on the next one coming from the Microsoft Smart Analytics world. Um, will Smart Analytics improve the quality of reporting or make it easier for owners to report? If so, how? Anything to add on that topic? Yeah, I can cover that. Uh, so the big uh, push in the in the tech industry is for to start with reporting and start with analytics uh, and then focus then on optimization. So the first step uh, from a Microsoft perspective is the Microsoft Cloud for Sustainability, which lets you uh, measure your emissions, measure your scope one, two and three emissions in, in particular um, for buildings, it's scope two emissions through um, either smart metering or sub-metering or through uh, your BMS uh, intake. So the first step there is to be able to, you know, have folks be able to read their BMS data and read their, um, you know, building management systems across the board, um, whether it's, you know, your JCI BMS or Honeywell BMS or, or Schindler or what have you. And then, uh, like, and, and then plug that data into the the analytics tools that that's the sustainability manager gives you and then put your you know live data uh, metrics on a dashboard so that you can see what emissions you're producing um, and then uh, further down the road um, the goal is to be able to you know have that engine make recommendations um, and that recommendations are based not only on what you're doing inside your building, but also provided by a whole bunch of IoT data that can couple with uh, what what these uh, emissions are producing. For example, during um, during lockdown and COVID, there were plenty of buildings um, overrunning uh, their uh, HVACs, and they they could have all been reduced because you know the occupancy was low. So to be able to have um, occupancy data, weather data. Uh, building movement data, all of that coming in, and then your HVAC systems optimally, you know, refactor how how much um, you know the HVAC needs to run is a very important part of the process. Um, and somebody doing it manually is just not going to scale in with several square, uh, thousands of square feet of buildings. So from a Microsoft perspective, that's what we aim to do here, mm -hmm. uh, and other other uh, you know people in the industry, in the tech industry is also following suit in that. Okay. Any other panelists want to chime in on this one? Okay. Uh, there's, a, there's a feature in our performance standard that um, offers a time performance pathway. Uh, it's not a requirement, but it's an option for buildings. Uh, so it would allow them to uh, calculate their emissions based on a uh, emissions factor that is nearly hourly or possibly hourly uh, for the electric grid. And so, you know, we are tr working on the implementation of, you know, the, providing that signal currently, but um, once it's established, I could imagine a lot of opportunities for uh, smart kind of building system integration to optimize uh, electricity consumption uh, from an emission standpoint. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. I would, uh, um, <laughs> one of the things that I think is a big opportunity is the dis disaggregation of um, especially heating loads within buildings. And so mm -hmm. we've seen some examples of, of buildings that through thermal recovery and thermal storage are um, the commercial buildings that are nearly able to heat themselves just by moving heat between areas of the buildings. Um, and so that's one of the big opportunities. Um, as far as you know, limiting capacity and improving the economics of uh, the transition to heat pumps is looking uh, at the disaggregated data in terms of end uses and also the time of use and the daily cycles and looking for those thermal opportunities. Yeah, that's really exciting stuff. There's going to be a uh, time, you know, and a few questions where you'll get to talk about your predictions for the future. So I'll be interested to see if those factor in. Okay, so. Why do we now seem to be moving towards statutory regulatory reporting requirements? Were voluntary methods not getting us there? Um, I'm gonna take Sandra. <laughs> I think, I, think I, I actually alluded to this at the beginning of my talk that in fact, no, voluntary methods are not getting us there. Um, 
We, you know, Seattle City Light has been doing efficiency programs since the 80s. 80s. They've been doing a fabulous job. Efficiency, you know, has improved to the point where their load is actually going down um, to some extent. And I look here because I know your city light and she could correct me if I'm completely mm -hmm. off base. But um, it, and, you know, incentive programs are great and they work for those who can access them and know about them and have the resources we see um folks who don't you know you know they're just not aware of them or they don't know they're there we um we had a tune-up accelerator program we had currently have a regulation the, for mandatory building tune-ups and we had an accelerator program for that city light provided great incentives and we had a 25 percent participation rate 25 percent of those building owners who would need to meet the requirement participated in this program to get free money to do the work they had to do anyhow and 25 percent participation rate is a very high participation rate but it does not get you where you need to go if you need to decarbonize your entire building stock it does not get you there and so we are unfortunately i think in a place where voluntary doesn't give us the scale and the breadth of the transition that needs to happen and luke and ross i think would either of you want to add something here? Well, you know, I, it's difficult, as noted before, to to gain energy efficiency out of existing buildings, whether it's voluntarily or even in in law. So, um, like Sandra said, we have some 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 large goals uh, out there, and it's it's going to take a little bit extra special work to get there. Yeah, I'd say that it's quite similar to what uh, Sandra described. It's, uh, you know, Sardo was in place for many years and we struggled at times to have, uh, with the uptake of its incentives, um, you know, there are just a lot of other alternatives uh, for building owners to ways to, for them to spend their money and efficiency just doesn't seem to uh, jump out uh, as a priority despite it saving them money. Um, I think it's, it's fairly complex to implement and you know, maybe there are just other opportunities that they see as more valuable. So that paired with the fact that our, we need to make progress very rapidly on re reducing emissions, uh, yeah, compliance seems, uh, or mandatory seems like we have to go down that path. Okay, Brett, I'm gonna start with you on this next one, um, since you're coming from the Rocky Mountain Institute and have more of a broad perspective. Um, and other folks, you can jump in if you have more to add. Um, so today we heard from both city and state, we heard about both city and state performance reporting. Um, what's going on in the rest of the country and internationally? Yeah, I, I can um, share that there. Obviously, we're we're seeing uptake of building performance standards across the U.S. and the cities and jurisdictions, and same thing um, in the EU. I think we, um, our Armas Buildings team, is increasingly active in um, in the global south, and so I've been doing a fair amount of work in India recently. And there's some really interesting activity that's going on um, in some of those emerging markets as well. We're in the midst of, uh, we're calling it Net Zero Accelerator Initiative, working with India's largest uh, real estate developer, who is has set an ambitious carbon neutrality target of 2035 and is trying to figure out, uh, is really serious about figuring out how to do that. And for them, I think it's, um, it's multifaceted. It's an indication of, uh, quality of product, it's an indication of reputation uh, that can actually help them gain access to uh, international finance markets, um, which can be which can be an advantage. Um, and, it, and it shows alignments with national uh, goals. And so India is one of the countries that has announced uh, decarbonization targets as part of uh, coming out of COP26. And so uh, the science-based target initiative has a has a global uh, presence now, and so 
this example of the real estate developer I mentioned, they've, they've announced an SBTA target and we're seeing um, uh, real estate corporations in the US adopting that as well. And so setting those targets, uh, actionable, tailored to the, uh, to the entity um, is, is one of the, is, a, is another mechanism outside of the regulations. It's at the um, voluntary stage, but it's also valuable to say investors um, as a, as an indication of uh, addressing climate risk and, and sort of innovation. Okay. Other panelists, anything to add here? Anything that pops out? Okay. So for this next one, Sandra, you touched on this in your presentation, and I, I think Ross also will have stuff to add, and probably Luke too, but um, buildings can be very unique in their use and occupancy. So how do you deal with standardized reporting in the face of the my building is different statement? Do you want me to, I can. Whoever wants to jump in first. Hey. I'll let Ross you can take a crack. <laughs> so, yeah. um, well, the, the reporting for us uh, and the limit setting uh, has been based on the use type of spaces within a building. So, you know, in large buildings, it's common that they have many different use types. Maybe they have some percentages residential, there's some uh, office space and maybe some ground floor retail or you know you can think of many many different combinations and uh, many of those do exist in the building stock in new york city so um we took kind of a uh, i would say a statistical approach by looking at our our, our very uh our rich benchmarking data resource um and plotted buildings of different use types and when i say use type i mean their primary use type and looked at the distribution of those, each of those use type plots. And uh, based on those, that's how we set our limits. And then since the limits are set based on use types, we also uh, require buildings to report based on use types. So they'll uh, tell us how much of their building is office or residential or commercial space. And that will uh, allow them to determine what their building specific emissions budget is. Um, so, you know, that's the way we've tried to address the fact that buildings all have different makeups and use uh, types and that use types have different emissions intensities. Uh, and we've updated that a little bit to make it a little bit more granular uh, based on some stakeholder feedback over the past few years. But uh, we think it, it addresses much of the issue uh, around, you know, in one, in one office, you may have a data center, and in another office, it's kind of a sleepy law firm. You know, breaking those out into different use types can help you uh, get to more equitable limits and then have them report that kind of more specifically. Um, Sandra or Luke, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I would just say, I think, you know, one thing is the this, you know, trend of uh, building performance targets, either energy or emissions based across the country and it sounds like in other countries as well in some ways the the idea is there's a performance based target and how you get there is then up to any individual building owner depending on the particular complexities of that building so there there's a built-in uh, ability for variation we're not saying you know thou shalt do x x and x and even in seattle we are specifically not saying we're it's an electrification requirement it's a uh, decarbonization requirement so if there are other way other you know carbon neutral fuels fabulous um so we think there's a certain amount of flexibility there and i think kind of to ross's point that you know the targets we are setting targets based on averages and so then, you know, some, you know, one of our consultants at one point said, you're going to about to have this stakeholder meeting where you're talking about the regulation for about five minutes and then the alternative compliance pathway for about 30. Is this really? So we do, I think we do have to allow flexibility in terms of understanding that each individual building, you know, the particular target may not may or may not work. And so there's this fine line between keeping a regulation simple, 
allowing flexibility and also making sure that at our at the back end that when the city is managing compliance it's not over burdensome and therefore costly and requires too much staff who might otherwise be helping a building owner to figure out what to do so it, I, I will say it is it's sort of a, a fine line but we think about it in this like 80 percent of buildings should be able to meet the requirements as is and then there are others for whom there are particular issues and i didn't even mention things like what about in seattle the unreinforced masonry buildings and there's you know work being done about what needs to happen for those and are there regulations on those and so which which buildings are those and how can we do both at the same time and you know historic situations what about cooking equipment so there's a lot of you know we are building in flexibility and trying to keep things simple so we'll see how we go yeah and i think this is another place technology can help in standardized reporting as well um mm -hmm. epa publishes you know a, a good set of uh scope two guidance around how to calculate your emissions based on the sources you have mm -hmm. the the scope two emissions are specific to for a smart facility and, and or facilities in general and uh two big portions of those are i mean the big big emissions um where you want to track them is around your purchase electricity um your fire suppression your refrigeration you know heat you know heat hvac systems you cover those and and they publish all they also publish formulas of how to calculate from those emissions how do you get to your emissions uh reporting and all the technology providers are in line with reporting it like that so um this is where you know technology can is, is help as well this the state engaged uh through stakeholder meetings during the rulemaking process um maybe eight to ten different stakeholder meetings uh, some of them held in this building before covid um, as an opportunity for um, stakeholders to uh, to present their special considerations so that we could build flexibility into the standard itself again standard 100 is the base standard uh, through that rulemaking process we actually expanded our building activity types we um, you know got more granular so we're up to about 100 different building activities with uh, targets so you can really um, do a, a, a quite concise area weighted target for your building based on the special considerations within that building and beyond that there's also uh, specific exceptions built within the standard uh, 100 itself and the ones that the state added to the standard to provide more flexibility. And then, of course, we have the investment criteria alternative to that uh, energy use intensity target performance metric. So that provides uh, even more um, allowances for buildings that are difficult to get to, to comply through an EUI target. Okay, so we're now going to go to our last formal question and then I have a lot that have come in from the audience and there will be an opportunity for folks in here as well. Um, so each panelist same question and we'll start with Ross and then work our way back all the way over to Sandra. Um, okay. So this is the last session of our three day conference and this is kind of a future casting question for you. What will be the main topics of conversation in the session on building performance reporting at SPX 2025? So starting with you, Ross. Well, I think by the time the first reporting periods will have closed. Uh, so it'll be probably some discussion about how the process went. Um, uh, what tools maybe have emerged uh, or, or need to be developed to improve the processes for reporting. Uh, I suspect there may also be, um, at least in New York, conversations about uh, expected availability of renewable energy certificates or carbon offsets, uh, because those are uh, tools that are built in as to, to give flexibility and compliance. 
So I wonder if there will be people thinking about, uh, or I suspect they'll be thinking about what's the availability and cost of those tools. And actually, That's my best guess right now, anyway. Yeah, and and I'm curious. I'm gonna I'm gonna change this slightly on the fly. I can go next. Am, am I next up here? You will be next, Brett, in one second. But I'm just gonna adjust this slightly. So 2025, three years in the future, things will have changed. But what about 2035? So take it again, Ross. <laughs> hey, hey. Uh, 2035, geez. Um, by then the grid should look a lot different. And uh, I, I hope we're, uh, we're like in full swing in terms of uh, Many, many, many buildings thinking about electrifying heating, heating and hot water. That's the central challenge in New York City's building stock is uh, we can't reach our our climate goals without reducing our, our, our really getting rid of the combustion of heat, uh, heating oil and natural gas in buildings for heating and hot water. So I think that there could be a period, you know, before 2030 where a lot of buildings don't have to grapple with that question. But by 2035, I think it's going to be a uh, really central question for probably the whole building stock. Uh, and it'll be, will it be the uh, resource efficient electrification like Brett and the Empire Buildings Challenge has been studying and maybe there's a pathway available based on that. Maybe there's uh, new equipment or new uh, retrofit strategies in place, but I think that it'll be really the electrification of heating and hot water will be in full swing. And it'll be at a time, like I said, when the grid is hopefully much cleaner and uh, drives that uh, with that incentive of a lower carbon energy source. Okay, and Brett, same question to you, and you can you can answer about twenty twenty five and twenty thirty five, or just pick one. There's a little bit of a lag, but I'm guessing it came to me next, so I'll, I'll jump in. The um, twenty twenty five, I think the conversation is going to be about um, about commoditization of these solutions. And so we're talking about a massive scale of action here and all of it's possible and currently being delivered often in a fairly custom way through um, engineering services and, uh, you know, and, and products. Um, but I think pretty quickly here, we're gonna to start to reach scale uh, and we're going to see a market open up for entrepreneurs to develop sort of mass customizable approaches for um, services and for products. And so I think the conversation here is going to shift pretty quickly to um, to supporting those and recognizing and accelerating those. Um, 2035, a little further out, I think where you know if everything goes well at 2035 we're going to start to see a crossover point in terms of market penetration and available solutions and so there's going to become an important and hot conversation on how to support the laggards who for whatever reason didn't start moving um and in fact we need to act right now to ensure that it's not the less resourced um you know parts of our communities that are, you know, stuck on the laggard systems and bearing the cost of that. Uh, and so I, th I think in 2035, that's, that's going to be the hot topic. Okay, Akshay? Yeah, uh, I'll echo what the other presenters have said. Uh, I think 2025, it would be, ha it'd be great to have a marketplace of tools that a, a set of choices where you can measure and report and, and reduce. Um, and you know this it should be it should be a clear choice where reporting is consistent and standardized where you know again one building's reporting is not super custom um and you know all the technology providers should be able to assist in this in this consistency as well as uh getting towards a carbon zero you know goal uh goal then and i think by 2035 i'll just take um, the Microsoft example, the Microsoft goal is by 2030, we're going to be carbon negative. And by 2050, which is much further, is we're going to have all the historical emissions 
also be our carbon zero. So anything that we've, any building that we have have since 1975, all the historical emissions we want to, you know, go, you know, negate those as well. Hmm. Um, I'm hoping by 2035 we'll have uh, case studies in progress of how we're not just carbon zero now, but also negate our historical emissions as well. So that's that's the goal that we want to reach. Okay, Luke. Well, uh, 2025, you know, I, I think it'd be exciting to see some case studies here at uh, the conference regarding uh, meeting these performance metrics, whether it's through the EYT or the uh, investment criteria of the standard. We have the early adopter incentive program in place now. We have early compliance coming in uh, July of 2023, so we should have some good some good data and some stuff to look at. Uh, it um, and then by 2035, you know, it's going to be a mature performance standard. We'll uh, have a lot of the kinks. Uh, worked out and got some clear paths for different uh, building owners and different kind of type of uses of buildings um, and well on our way to um, uh, decarbonization. Okay, last but not least. Yeah, so um, I will say and I'm going to just sort of group like 2035-2025 in this hold is that I think uh, we will be seeing not presentations on regulations, because frankly, they're not as exciting as how is this happening in buildings, like some of those, you know, diagrams that Brett was showing, how are building owners, you know, what is this decarbonization over time plan, what's happened to date, what are the innovations that have come about because building owners have needed to think about where they're headed. And, um, you know, how does resilience fit in this? I think we, we, you know, we keep talking emissions, but, you know, how does, re, how do we, resilience? And then also, I think in 2035, we're going to have to, it's going to be a reassessment time. How has this worked? Where are our emissions? What are we, I hope, actually, is right, and we are, like, down and going, you know, sort of solving the problem. But how do we need to adjust and recalibrate what we're planning? Okay. Thank you so much to the panel. Um, we're going to move now into audience questions. For those who are located here in our space, we have a microphone in the center of the room. Um, so if you do have a question, please um, go over to the microphone to ask it so that everyone can hear what you're saying. I have a bunch of questions that have come in from the audience that I'm scrolling through here. And I'm going to start with, I'm going to combine two questions and sort of rephrase here. Um, these were directed at Sandra and at Ross, um, but I think anyone can chime in who has thoughts to share. Um, so for both New York City and Seattle's requirements, um, what do you plan to do or what are you doing or what are your thoughts about how we'll handle the financing for the necessary retrofit? I can start and say we we the city of Seattle are not ourselves banks or financers. Um, the state has a CPACE program, um, property assessed clean energy and resilience program. So that's a really good tool. The uh, municipal electric utility Seattle City Light has an energy efficiency as a service option, which is again, it's not a it's not a finance tool, but it's a means of repaying on your utility bill. And so that's a, a great program. So I think, I think we hope to see some innovation in the banking world and the lending world. Um, one of the things we are looking at um, and exploring how to get seed funding for would be how to set up loan products that really address uh, building owners who have less capacity to take on debt and some of these products are just really not designed for smaller buildings or smaller loans um, so that's what we're from yeah and so in new york we are uh actually required had, we were required to pause our pace program unfortunately for a few months but i think that's going to be coming back online soon um you know we had pace in place for some time uh, and number of deals were uh, or, or loans were extended. 
But I think what was clear, I think Sam just kind of pointed this out, is that PACE isn't applicable for all building types that are subject to our building performance standard. Uh, it's not a good match for a lot of multifamily buildings who already have Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loans in place in the most senior position. And so PACE won't work there. Uh, so I think we're hoping that uh, perhaps Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, or other residential lenders to residential properties can um, innovate a little more. Um, we've seen some other loan tools or financial tools. The Catalyst loan is one that's uh, somewhat interesting that's come out of a team that grew out of the Connecticut Green Bank. Um, and we're wondering if that can be a tool for that multifamily segment. Um, but I also wonder if there aren't, uh, you know, public financing options that will grow as well. Um, I know that that's a method that's used to uh, support water infrastructure, uh, which kind of provides a public good. And we're, we're looking at protecting a public good here as well. So maybe there's tools that are used there that can be adapted. We're, we similarly are really restricted, us being the city, from putting uh, budget funds into privately owned buildings. So I, I think it would require state participation and maybe federal as well uh, to put together a tool like that. Okay. Does anyone have anything else to add on the financing side? Obviously a very important and you know, important question, also a conundrum. Well, in addition to our tier one early adopter incentive program, we will be uh, creating an early adopter incentive program for the tier two buildings. Mm -hmm. um, so expect more of that in the future. Okay. okay, I'm going to give our in house question uh, or, you know, attendee an, op an opportunity to ask a question. So come on up and just okay. say your name um, beforehand and Thank you. Uh, my name is Aiden, and I had a question about data. So before we can report and reduce, we have to be able to collect data and understand it. And I don't mean to out the fantastic, lovely Washington State University I came from, but for older parts of their campus, they could see the load, but they couldn't tell you which buildings were contributing to which parts of it. And so whether they're going to decide about putting insulation in or switching water heaters to heat pump water heaters, they couldn't decide which would be better for them. So how do we help these old buildings first collect the data they need to make choices and then understand the data that they get? That's a great question. Um, I, I'm thinking of you, Akshay, yeah. but I know other folks here have the, dealt with this problem. So, yeah. I, and this is this is a good. It's a very good question. It's a pretty common problem of how to measure uh, how to measure your your emissions, um, and it starts with data. Um, the I mean. It, it needs some investment on their part. Uh, the easy, not the easiest, but the, the most straightforward, but not the most cost effective um, investment is metering. So having your buildings metered uh, is uh, super important for you to know where the sources are, uh, the emission sources are there. If that is not an option, um, I think there's an, we're, we're still figuring out an approximation of how to get your refrigeration, air conditioning, uh, fire suppressant and uh, you know all the you know, industrial loads to be able to calculate your your emissions through there. Um, the science is fuzzy there. Uh, we'll, that's still being you know being developed, but that's that's the next next best thing. Um, and um, you know I think making inroads into those areas where absolutely me like measuring what you're producing is going to lead to how much you want to save. Um, but without the, abs with the absence of, of data, that's something that, that investments need to be made. Any yeah. other panelists? Yeah. Who was that? Luke? Um, yeah, you know, I, we, we've done such a great job in many aspects of uh, this world collecting data and using data to um, improve performance of systems, right? We need to start bringing that, uh, the, those um, mentalities into how we operate our buildings. And hopefully through this whole process of developing an energy management plan, operations and maintenance programs, uh, building operators uh, and building owners invest in um, good data systems to, 
to create good data because we can't really optimize the performance and the um, uh, the longevity of our equipment and systems if we don't see what they're doing. I would, I would note that uh, the, the nature of of carbon neutrality as a goal does change the game as well. So it's not just about optimization of energy consumption and sort of the quickest return, but it's about a fundamental transition over time. And so, uh, yeah, there are significant hurdles to data and maybe even knowing what equipment is in what building, especially for older buildings. Um, but there's a different type of asset planning involved with looking at uh, how well systems are using, where there are problems, where there's going to be, where there's deferred maintenance, where there's going to be equipment end of life. Uh, that's a different sort of qualitative um, planning exercise that then gets translated into an asset lifetime and sort of an investment planning exercise, um, which does look at, look a little bit different. Um, and 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 yeah, and so and may require. Um, you know, different types of data, um, but it, but it's, it's a little bit more fundamental and it's more about uh, serving the building needs, you know, the loads as opposed to just energy optimization. Thank you. Um, Tanya, did you wanna come up and ask your question and then I'll uh, take some more from the online. Okay, thank you. Hi, um, my name is Tanya Barham. I'm with Community Energy Labs. Um, I would encourage folks to watch the grid interactive building recording from the other day because the scenario I'm going to bring up sort of comes from there, which is I'm hugely supportive of um, net zero carbon buildings and all of the amazing work that all of you are doing on the building code and regulation side. On the flip side, the IPCC and many utilities have taken this to heart in their commitments and they've started passing along um, more complex utility rates, time varying rates, uh, dynamic rates, demand charges. And we found this really interesting seam where even here in Washington, working with Tacoma Power and Franklin Pierce School District, you might have 60 to 200 gas RTUs, which you now replace with a heat pump, which is great because now they have AC too, which we need more and more in the Pacific Northwest. But you also have this massive demand spike in the morning where even if there's embedded optimized controls, on that unit if they're trying to get the fresh air turns between 6 and 8 a.m it can be five times as high as any other point in the day on that demand spike and in california we're seeing electrical bills where literally their demand charges are since you know they have a net energy metering for solar demand charges are 80 percent of their bill and it's massive so controls are really necessary to bridge this gap between time varying prices and uh building electrification but i don't hear anyone talking about controls uh no cut on some of the control systems that are you know sponsoring this conference but you know a 230,000 rigid control system that uses proportional integral derivatives or rules-based control isn't going to cut it for smaller tier two type buildings so why aren't we talking about smart controls more in this space to bridge that gap between time varying prices and electrification so I'm wondering who wants to take this easy question? <laughs> <laughs> um, Brett, how do, do you feel prepared to answer? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, we absolutely have to be talking about controls and demand flexibility. And um, I think that that's sort of the leading edge of, of thought right now. But pretty quickly here, we're going to have to start solving those problems. Um, I actually heard a, a leading engineer not too long ago in, the, in this context of talking about decarbonization raise the question like is electrification of heating also going to bring the end of building setbacks so that we don't have to spike loads in the morning during morning warm-up periods um, and so that heat pumps can keep running on part load optimal um, efficiency and it's a really interesting question like how is this gonna change the game uh there are um so we're, we're participating in this program through the department of energy called connected communities um there's there are 
I think it's 10 pilot projects across the U.S. over the next three or four years that are going to be implementing uh, large-scale demand flexibility pilots working with utilities and developing sort of the business models, value propositions, and most importantly, the sort of functionality and interoperability uh, to figure out how to actually implement that at scale. And so I think that's one really exciting place to keep watching. Um, but it's, it's absolutely going to be important and it's going to have to be uh, automated because you can't, you can't do enough demand response calls to solve, uh, to solve, you know, every morning ramp up period. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I'd say in local on 97's case, as I was mentioning earlier, there's, there is a time of use compliance option that's being developed, which will provide a most likely an hourly carbon intensity signal for, for electricity. And that probably will lead to some uh, solutions involving controls that, you know, I think that we've been trying to provide signals that lead to carbon reduction and efficiency and we're not prescribing solutions. Uh, so, you know, but I, I think that that signal will uh, hopefully uh, drive some development of uh, more flexible uh, controls and, and other, you know, distributed systems. Okay. Um, I am going to go, this is a, there's an interesting question from the audience here um, that refers back to one of our uh, topics that came up in the plenary, which I was actually chatting with someone about before the session started. So clearly this is like a really interesting topic because um, it keeps coming up. Um, so this person saying during the plenary, the concept of converting existing office space, uh, sorry, existing office buildings and space that is unused or under, underutilized to affordable housing came up. Um, so generally speaking, I think this is an idea that's really you know, um, current for folks living in cities, especially like Seattle, where, you know, are people returning to their office spaces? You know, what is that going to mean for all different things? And in this case, what is that going to mean for performance reporting? Um, so you, you can answer any or all of this. They're saying, you know, how realistic is that idea? Um, are there already firms that are moving towards changing the use, the uses of commercial space to other forms of space? Um, and then what would the implications be? Uh, for performance uh, standards if spaces start to become far more complex in their uses, um, or maybe it's heterogeneous in their uses. Um, and I would just say, you know, this, this just all speaks to sort of the question of, and, and certainly you guys are not prognosticators, you're not going to be able to tell us what the future holds, but we still are in the midst of this transition. I mean, this this closing session is a good example of how much things have changed where <laughs> there's a lot more to manage as a person uh, running a moderate panel that's hybrid with people piped in, etc. Um, so, you know, what do you think the return to the, to the office space, the potential that we're all hearing for different uh, changes to the way those buildings are being used, different occupancy as a result, what might that mean for building performance standards, if anything at all? Does it affect things? And um, I guess I'll start here with you, Sandra. I, I always get it because I'm just right here. I was actually, I was just flagging on one of the things um, we have, so I'm not going to, you know, comment on whether transitioning from office to multifamily might be a good idea, but the, you know, performance standards are based on the activity type. So as the activity type changes, then you, the expectations and the, the standards would change correspondingly. It strikes me that you know, for I think the three of us here who've talked about regulation, we have these five year compliance cycles. And I don't remember if in New York City, if you're reporting and complying every year, what we have intended is that you comply and prove your performance every five years. So in between, you will be benchmarking and reporting your performance, but we're, you know, we're not, we're not going to be dinged for where you are. It strikes me that if space use changes more quickly, then there may be a need to actually monitor that on a more regular basis as opposed to these five year increments. Um, so that's just, you know, one thought. And then the other thought is, I think one of the things these performance standards are doing, in addition to code, is signaling where we hope to be. And so hopefully, 
as these changes are being made to the types of uses, then it's being done in a manner that looks out to the future of how that building needs to be performing and building systems and the, um, the planning work is being done to make sure that it's consistent with getting to net zero carbon. Um, so yeah, in New York City, compliance is annual. So in reporting is annual. And I think just, you know, the way that the limits are set, um, if there were uh, many conversions from office to residential spaces, I mean, the, from my memory, the residential spaces have a lower, uh, uh, lower greenhouse gas intensity than the commercial spaces. So it could be that, you know, that just yields lower uh, impact buildings, but I think it also would involve significant uh, upgrades, which would face uh, the new, much more stringent building codes. So I think probably yield higher performing residential spaces. Uh, that, that's a bit of a guess. Yeah, they, there are, you know, significant remodels and commercial buildings may trigger uh, um energy code requirement so that could add to the improvement in performance during those transition periods or because of the transition to a different building activity um, the state standard does have certain exemptions and allowances when you do do a change from one building use to another use especially when there's occupancy permits required and you know if you don't have two years of data um, with the new occupancy, it's going to be difficult to compare yourself to a baseline. So uh, these are some complications that are, in many cases, addressed within the standard, within the nuances of the standard. In some cases, uh, it may be more difficult and less straightforward than that. But um, it's, you know, guidance is always evol evolving as these specific situations arise. and. Uh, we talked about the 2025 and the 2035 conferences. We'll have a lot of lessons learned. And mm -hmm. uh, like I said, the, the standards will be mature. The industry will be more mature and, um, you know, be an exciting conference. Okay. Brett or Akshay, anything to add before we close the discussion? No, I, I, um, I mean, on that topic i think obviously a building change of use is a, a massive trigger event and so um you'd expect that if you're uh, touching a building and we see this like in repositioning of just of commercial buildings but um a change of usage would be a trigger to do a holistic approach and um uh, i don't have a crystal ball to see how our building or our, how our cities um will change over time but what sure would be great if we were solving our nation's housing crisis and by the way we solved our energy crisis at the same time. <laughs> yeah <laughs> that wouldn't no complaints there um okay so we are going to take one more question because there's someone in the audience standing at the mic looking at me um so this will be our very last question um come on up say your name i don't think brett and i can hear you yeah i'm Stuart richter with the point to point zoo and uh i had some questions about back net and um <clears throat> basically right now we're looking at doing an upgrade on uh, most of the, the zoo, we have uh, a carbon neutral aquarium that is uh, has a high efficiency air stack heat pump, and we have a Honeywell system that's running that. But um, so I've got different cookie jars. I've got a back net cookie jar, and I've got a lawn works cookie jar, and I need to bring that data in and do some uh, you know analysis, come up with some uh, plans. And uh, so I'm just kind of curious how we're. Well, first the state, then the local, we're a, a park, and it'd be nice if everybody could kind of come to a, a, a consensus on how we're going to get to where we are taking that data in and we're able to look at our buildings, our power bills and all that stuff with the dissimilar networks. Yep. And uh, I think the lady, I didn't get her name, but she was kind of late into that as well as far as, you know, doing the data and, and bringing all these other dissimilar networks together to be able to talk. and and get that data. So thank you. Can I take okay. yes. Yeah, good question. So uh, the good uh, the good news is that there's actually now, I want to say at least five to six providers that I know who can read about, you know, 100, 
over 100 different protocols, including BACnet, including LoRaWAN, including LawnWorks, uh, and aggregate that data into you know a, a system that reports. Um, Microsoft itself is working with a, quite a few of them. Uh, I want to say out of uh, out of the six that I know, we're working with at least five of them. Um, I'm happy to you know share uh, some of those providers with you who, who do that. Um, but you know, as we're looking through the future, we, we I think that this is going to just become a very standard thing that you plug, you know, you plug a technology piece in, and regardless of the underlying protocol, it, it can read that data in. Uh, the question really becomes is that does the backnet data come with smart meters as well? So if, if in your facility, if you have it, if you have it metered, and that's on backnet, you're you're ahead of the game. But if you don't have it metered, then you know, then we'll have to, you know figure out some kind of calculation of how to get that the multiple sources of data uh, telling you that this is what your emissions are. So the good news is that like, people are already in the marketplace, like doing exactly the stuff that uh, you're looking for. Okay, I think with that, we're going to close the session. Um, thank you all for joining us remotely online and thank you for coming into the room. Uh, it's been great joining with you the last three days for this programming and thanks again to our sponsors. Um, for folks who are here in the room, we do have lunch outside. So if you want to grab some lunch, you can stick around and we can do that old thing we used to do where we talk to each other in person. Um, so thank you. And that concludes the conference. Thank you.